Now the policeman said to me, does your dog you know, normally do this? I said, never. And then all of a sudden, the penny dropped. It's dusk, the dog's barking like this. He's trying to warn us all, it's coming. Seeing is believing, and I have no proof of what I saw that day other than what I can describe. It was huge. It was like the weightlifter of cats. Welcome to Big Cat Conversations. We speak directly to people who've encountered one of Britain's big cats. We also discuss the bigger picture. I'm Rick Minter, and thanks for joining me. A warm welcome to you all. I was asked by a listener recently if I was ever shocked anymore by big cat reports. Then two days later I heard about the incidents coming up for this show and I got a reminder that this subject is still full of surprises. So our guest is Billy, Billy Brown, who is now based in Scotland, but we'll be discussing a case from 2015 in the Derbyshire Peak District when Billy was based there and worked as a railway line inspector. So, Billy, thanks for coming on and welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Rick. How are you getting on? Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Billy. I know that um, people are going to be very interested in hearing about walking along a railway line because we we often talk about what do the cats do on these linear routes, especially railway lines. And you might be able to give us an insight to the possibilities from that. So we'll have that a little bit later on. And before we start hearing about the actual first part of the encounter, can you tell us, did you ever give the thought of big cats any kind of attention in your life? Yeah, we see it in the papers all the time. You know, people come up with big cat stories and stuff. I have believed they've always been out there. How many of them are out there, I don't know. I totally believe in them now anyway, yeah. There's several steps in the process, actually, of, of this encounter. Take us through. The first one was a, arriving to work, but you couldn't get to work because there was a panther in the way. Is that about it? A bit of my background is uh, I was an inspector on the railway for 10 years. I don't know if in, from uh, inspections, designs, renewals, that I left Network Rail in 2016. So this story, yeah, goes back to when I was on a, a, an inspection team and I was inspecting a platform one night in, uh, in Edo. I'd left the station, Edo station, at about, must have been about half past four in the morning, heading back towards Stockport, and came out of Edo station. I was in a Vauxhall combo van. Came around the corner, I was only about, maybe not even a quarter of a mile from the station, and sat in the middle of the road was a Black Panther. There was another lad with me, but yeah, I came around the corner, there was a Black Panther in the, the middle of the road, and as soon as my headlights hit it, it jumped from the centre of the road right into the bushes. It was only a single track road, there was no lines on it or anything like that, it made just one leap from, from the centre of the road right into the hedges. It must have been just, you know, took off into a field. The eyes hit me first, and I thought, you know, what's that? You know, I thought it was a badger or something. But the size of it, when all the headlights went on it, it was about as big as, I'd say, like a medium-sized Rottweiler dog. It was some size of animal. The tail was probably something like three-quarters the length of its body or something, a big, thick tail, pearl on the end. What was the conversation? <laughs> Dan just said, what was that? And I was like, you know, that was a panther that or something. And he was like, no way. Do you know what I mean? And then, uh, you know, we spoke about it a bit before we got back to the depot. You know, we didn't really tell any, anyone else, you know, especially within the rail industry. You know, you've got to watch what you say sometimes. You know what I mean? A bit of ridicule here and there. Yeah, we just sort of kept it to ourselves that night. Was there any other distinguishing features? Not at that time. But you know something? It's, it's like sometimes you don't believe what you see. Yeah. You know, e- even though you know what you've seen, but you really can't, you know, it's like, did I really see that? And you, sometimes you start to doubt yourself. Yeah, even though it's so vivid. Yep. Did it have any attitude? I think it was a bit shocked. This is like half past four in the morning. There's no traffic at that time in the morning in that area. I don't think it expected a van or a vehicle to come around the corner. It's just sat in the road, it's listening, and it's probably thinking, you know, what's this coming? all of a sudden, a van comes around the corner. You know, we were only doing probably 15 mile an hour or something like that. So we've come around the corner pretty slow. It's just jumped out the way. How far in front of you was it and how long was the sighting for? I would say it was probably about 20 feet ahead of us. And that sighting there was only for about three seconds. You know, by the time we've come around the corner, it's seen it, it's seen us, and then it's leapt out the way. Maybe three, three or four seconds. Had you ever heard of any other local sightings before this? Not in that area. 
but there was another sighting, and, and it wasn't too far away from there. It was still in the Peak District. It's a place called Blackwell Mill. It's just outside Buxton. You can follow a little a single track down to the Monsell Trail. There's like an, an old railway line, some viaducts. There was rumours of a sandy-coloured puma. Another one of the railway workers spotted it. It goes down to the river, and it eats fish. It had been sighted eating fish. They actually had a cycle hire place down there. The railway worker went into the cycle place. They said, yeah, we're familiar with this. And they've got a record of all the big cat sightings in that area. Okay. There's not a lot of cyclists as big cat witnesses. Their head's in a different space when they're cycling to, to pick up things. It's something like that, I think. There must be something. They haven't got that peripheral vision and they're not looking from side to side, perhaps. I think it's those sorts of issues. That's it. Now, that was part one, but part two was a lot more involved. Oh, here we go. Go on, go for part two. Sock it to us. This story happened in, uh, well, this sighting ad uh, happened in, in 2015. I didn't tell anyone. The reason being, obviously, we worked in the real industry for a company. Where this sighting was and stuff, if I, if I just started broadcasting this sighting and it started affecting, you know, passengers on the rail and stuff, you'd get in big, you know, serious trouble for it. So I kept it to myself. Yeah. And the only reason it is, it's come to light recently is because I was on Facebook and stuff. There was an article put up from the Daily Mail, and it was Rhoda Watkins. Uh, I think you've interviewed her before, haven't you? Yeah, she's a good contact of mine, yeah. She didn't put the post up, but basically it was, it was on the Daily Mail page, and it was about, you know, big cats in Britain and stuff and, you know, the growing population. And do you know something? I read some of these comments, and I thought, there's a lot of people out there who don't know what's out there, if, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Some of the comments she was getting, I'm thinking, what I did, I found her on Facebook, dropped her a message and said, listen, I said, I'm, I'm a railway worker from the Peak District. I said, can I share my story with you? And what she said, she says, look, she says, the gentleman to, to speak to is yourself, Rick Minter. So she gave me her email and I sent my story across. So that's the only reason it's, it's come to light recently. So, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what happened. Mm. So I was working at, at the time out of uh, Chinley Peeway Depot. So Chinley is, is a, a village in the Peak District, not far from Whaley Bridge. There's inspection teams, there's maintenance teams. From that depot, we inspect all the quarries in the Peak District, right across to Sheffield Totley Tunnel, and then down to Hazel Grove near Stockport. On that patch, there's the, the four longest non-electrified tunnels in the UK. Now, Calburn Tunnel is just between Chinley and Edale. It's the deepest tunnel in the UK. It's about two miles long, I think. So... I was part of an inspection team. We were leaving from Chinley Depot the night time. There was three of us in. It was a Saturday night. There should have been four of us, but we were a man down that night. We left the depot. I was driving that night, driving a transit van. I dropped two patrollers off to inspect the tunnel. Now, I dropped them at a place called Chinley Wash, and it's where some lines meet. You've got the main line between Manchester and Sheffield, and then onto that line comes a line from the quarry, from a Peak Forest quarry. So I drop two guys off there, and they start walking. So they've got about roughly half a mile walk before they hit Calburn Tunnel. After I drop them off, I drive to Edil. So I set off in my van from there, and it probably takes me about, I would say, half an hour, 45 minutes. This is quite a long patrol. So the patrol goes from near Chinley, and it goes all the way to Earl Sidens, which is a siden what has like cement wagons for Hope Cement Works. So the, the whole inspection... It's probably about seven miles on this night. Billy, you're, you're all doing this because that is when inspections are done because there's going to be no movement on the line and you're all safe and that's when it's scheduled. Is that right? Yes, that's right. So it's, uh, it's green zone working, which means there's no trains running. We take uh, a line blockage and, yeah, it's, it's the safest way to do it. Two people have to go through a tunnel together. You know, if somebody, you know, there's no phone signals in the tunnel. So two people go through a tunnel, which left me on my own. So. I've drove around to the other side of the tunnel. I've parked the van up. This patrol, you've got to be hardy to do it. Do you know what I mean? So it's from just before Edale Station at the other end of, of Calvin Tunnel. And it's all the way to uh, Earl Sidens. It's five miles. I'm doing that patrol. I've parked the van up. I've walked down to the line. Pitch black. Probably talking about half past 12, quarter to one in the morning. So I've, I've got a, a works phone on me. It's, uh, it was like an old Nokia. Yeah, most of the, the railway network is run by O2. But on this patrol, you've got an orange phone. Now, orange will only pick up signal a couple of points on this inspection. I've pretty much got no phone with me. I get onto the track, and I, I start 
patrolling. So, so what you're looking for is, is a patroller, you know, any defects on the track. Yeah, Billy, one thing to establish, how long after your sighting, when you turned up to work and had one sitting in the road, was this event? This event was probably four months after. Okay. Four or five months, I would say. Fair enough. Okay, yeah. All we're concentrating on as, as patrollers is the track in front of you. I'm only concentrating on one line, and I'm, I'm walking out towards Sheffield Way. So, yeah, I, I start walking. I'm, I'm inspecting the track. There's nothing unusual. Following the track, looking for any defects. You're looking at the line side fencing as well. You know, embankments. You're looking at any structures. You know, has any, any buildings been put up recently? Anything affecting the stability of the track? And uh, you're looking at the fastenings, the sleepers, the ballast. You know, the railhead itself. At this time, I'd been issued a, a brand new LED torch from work. Absolutely amazing thing. You, you should put it on charge all week, and then it's got two settings on the, the torch itself. So you've got you know low beam, and then you've got main beam. So I've, I've set off and I've walked about half a mile towards Edale Station. So I'm, I'm walking on the track and, and I've, I've got a platform at either side walking towards it. It's quite, quite a small station, but I'm not sure. It's probably about 80 metres long. What you normally do as a patrol when you approach a station, put your, your light on full beam. And what you're looking for, you know, is there anyone hanging around the car parks? Sometimes you can have a lot of drug paraphernalia around stations, you know, where people go at night time and, and you, know, you know, they're up to no good. You're looking for anything that may affect your know, passengers. Has anyone left anything? And yeah, I've, I've got halfway into, into this station and I've put my full beam on and I look into the station car park and there's, there's a cat sitting. It's, it's a panther. Like For me, it was only... I'm halfway through the platform now. I'm stood in the middle of the platform and the platform where you would normally stand as a passenger, that's probably up to the top of my chest. It's about 1.2 metres or something from the ground to the top of the platform. So I'm looking along the, the, the floor of the platform. There's a little fence, and the, the fence is only about just roughly my waist. Mm-hmm. It's a fence you can see through. The station car park, there was about three cars parked in there. And I'm getting chills when I'm telling you, <laughs> telling you the story. Like, Yeah. Uh, and sorry. Yeah, no, it happens to other um, guests, yeah, yeah. you know, reliving it. It really brings back the emotions. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it does. Like So between me and the fence is about... 2.5 meters then from the fence car parking spaces is, is about four meters long just at the front of one of the the spaces opposite there was like a, a voxel vector and right in the back corner is a panther just sitting looking at me i've got the full beam on i've got an absolute superb uh, look at it and uh I'll, I'll tell you how big it was so so i can give you a scale mm-hmm. its head was in line with the back lights of the vehicle so you've got, you know, a space from the, the ground to the bottom of the bumper. You've got the depth of the bumper, and then you've got the rear lights of the car, and its head was perfectly in line. What got me was the eyes. Now, the eyes were probably, I'd say, two and a half inches apart, maybe three inches apart, roughly. The the size of its eyes. Do you remember we used to get marbles? <laughs> yeah, not half. Yeah, I used to love marbles. you got the small marbles, and then you've got the next size up, but we're slightly bigger. Yeah, its eyes were like that size, and they were bright green. Now, I've got full beam on this animal, and it didn't even flinch. It just sat there, and it just stared at me. It was jet black, shiny. It had a little shiny nose. I, I didn't see its tail. Its tail must have been tucked behind it, mm. and it had, it had tiny ears. The ears were quite small. In relation to the size of the cat, yeah, the ears, the ears were small. Yeah. And do you know what, Rick? Yeah, it was just like I looked at this thing. And I've got no one to phone. I've got no phone signal. I'm trapped between two platforms. You know, I've, I've got nowhere to run. You know, when I, when I look each way, I've, I've got 40 or 50 metres one way. I've got 40 or 50 metres the other way. And I can't get out of where I am. I can't get out of. And it's higher up than you are. Yep, it's higher up than me. And from its perspective, it's looking at me. And it'll think I'm small because it can only see from my chest up. And then plus, it's looking at a light, so it probably doesn't understand what I am. You know, it's, it's probably been sat there thinking, you know, it's heard something coming along, and then I've turned up, and I'm looking at it, and it's thinking, what is that? It probably can't make me out. You couldn't see my figure, because if you look at a bright torch, you can't see what's behind it. Yeah, sure. You know, you're just a face of the light. So I don't think it, it knew what I was. But I'll tell you something, Rick. It was an absolute beautiful creature. Absolutely. 
you know, jet black, shiny. You know when when you sort of see a Black Panther online or you Google images of a Black Panther, you know, and you see them like walking or whatever, and it was absolutely massive. You get big Rottweiler dogs, don't you? Yeah. But this thing was like, you know, it was very, very stocky, probably about a medium-sized Rottweiler dog. Mm. And uh, wow. What was its um, attitude again? Was it sitting there just calm and relaxed or was it alert or what kind of demeanour did it have? You could tell it was probably alert. You know, like when you see a normal cat, you'll make a noise and it'll look at you and it, it sort of is, it's sort of pricked up, it's watching you, it's wondering what you're doing. And that's what it was like. It wasn't aggressive. It didn't look scared. And yeah, it was just, it was like a staring competition, <laughs> but it couldn't see my eyes. And do you know something? When I think back now, I'm glad it couldn't see my eyes because if we'd have had a staring, you know, like sometimes you say, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't really stare things in the eyes. Yeah. You know, thank God my torch on. And, you know, I'm glad it couldn't see my eyes now. You know, when I think back, because I'm not scared of nothing. I had a, quite a rough upbringing, like, yeah. and uh, I'm not scared of anything. But let me tell you, you know, looking at one of these creatures, th- these are top of the food chain. Yeah, these are designed. If they can bring a deer down, right? Truthfully, I, I don't think a human would stand a chance, to be honest, if it was, you know, wanting to go for you. So I just I stared at it, and I, I got a really good look at it, and then I'm sort of thinking, I've got an inspection to do here. You know, there's a train running tomorrow morning, probably just after 6 a.m. You know, I've, I've got another four miles to walk. Like, So what I did, I just had a really good look at it. Unfortunately, I didn't have a camera phone with me. My phone's in the van. There's no point taking a phone with me. I've got no phone signal there anyway. I've got a little basic Nokia phone. I've got no camera on that. And I thought, do you know what? There was no one to tell anyway, Rick. You, you know what I mean? I've, <laughs> yes. I've, got no one, I've got no one around me. What was I meant to do? Yeah. You know what I mean? So how far away was this from your first um, sighting? It, it was only from, from my first sighting. So imagine where the cat's sitting. Yeah. Uh, just behind that is a little bit of a field and then a road. I would say it was only about 100 yards from my other sighting. Around the corner sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Same cat, do you think? Yeah, possibly, yeah. Same cat, same family, maybe. Yeah, okay. Incidentally, did your torch um, spotlight have a strobe effect? No. Okay, because I always say to people, if you are worried, if you encounter one at night and you've got them in your head torch, I don't think they would like the strobe effect. There's one thing you might, and, and you were concerned and you wanted to warn it away. Personally, I would try that before I tried anything else. Yeah, yeah. No, it would make sense, wouldn't it? Yeah. You say you weren't scared of anything, but presumably that was scary. Yeah. Well, from the position I was in, like you say, cat's higher up. Yeah. Between me and the cat is only a four foot fence. I'm on track in a station platform. You know, trying to get up at you. Yeah, I can get onto a station platform. You know, anyone can jump up there. Mm. It's not a quick thing to do. If I had a run for me and hopped that fence, I would have had no chance. I would have tried to fight it off in the, on the track, obviously, but I would have had no chance, I don't think, the size of it. And did it just carry on sitting there and, and just watching you and that was it? Yep, it didn't flinch. It, it didn't attempt to walk off. Obviously, I wasn't going to throw anything at it and I wasn't going to try and you know make it angry or anything like that. It just sat and watched me. How long were you there? Was, it, was the staring competition going for? I must have had my eyes on it for about four minutes. So, yeah, really, really, really good look at it. Big paws, big chunky legs. The paws were totally in line in front of it, you know, you know its legs. Uh, its paws were, were sort of together, maybe facing of about, you know, a hand's width apart, you know what I mean? It was sitting sphinx-like, really, was it? Yes, yeah, yeah. And it didn't, on all it moved was its head, is that right? It didn't even move its head. You, you know, I could sort of tell it was alert. Yeah. See what you could see, its nostrils, a bit of steam coming out. You know, it was like breathing, you know, you could see, you could see that. To, to be honest, I, I didn't want to get any closer. Did you look the first one and this one up on Google Images or in textbooks or whatever and make any conclusions about what it was? Well, when I research these, if you just put Black Panther in Google and get an image search, that's exactly what it was. I've seen some of these, you know, some you know, have faded markings on and stuff, but from the view I got of it, I couldn't tell if it had any markings. To me, it was just jet black. But do you know something, Rick? It was very, very good condition. Yeah. When I've Googled some other cats online, some of them... They don't look a bit scruffy looking. The, the the way they look is for how they live, if that makes sense. Mm. You know, there's some long haired. This thing, yeah, it was absolutely smooth, jet black, great condition. 
Well, that's often the case. I mean, I would say the majority, and our listeners can judge for themselves, but I personally, I think the majority of our guests and other witnesses I hear so often say, you know, very healthy condition. Yeah, yeah. So you saw one for four seconds and one for four minutes. <laughs> yeah, I did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow, okay, yeah. So, and then you just decided, well, you've got a job to do, to move on. Yeah, yeah, well, I thought it's going to be a train running over here about six o'clock in the morning. I just carried on, Rick. Mm. Uh, just carried on with what I was doing. Came out the station, so you, so you come out of this station, I'm still heading towards Sheffield. There's a bridge you've got to cross, right outside the station. I've crossed the bridge, and from this point, I've still got, about three miles to go, three and a half miles or something. So yeah, just carry on as normal, uh, in, inspecting. So as you come off this bridge, I'm now on an uh, embankment. So at both sides, it slopes down the side of the side of the track into fields, and then you've got fences at the bottom. You know, just like sheep net fences. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I can just carry on with my patrol. I'm out in the open now, pitch black everywhere. I've put my torch. It's, it's now on on a dim beam. The reason you don't have it on full beam all the time is I need my torch to last all the inspection. Yeah, get walking. So as, as you're walking along, you've got Edel Road. It just about runs parallel with you. It sort of comes at a slight angle, but it's, but it's pretty much parallel. And I'm now heading towards another bridge. So the road, Edel Road, is going to come underneath where I'm walking. The road comes underneath, it snakes, and then runs parallel, but on the other side of the railway track. So yeah, I'm continuing my walk. I've got about a mile from the station, and I can hear a vehicle coming. So the vehicle is, is the transit where I dropped off earlier. I'm now being leapfrogged by my, my other two guys. The van's coming along slow. The van's doing about 20 miles an hour. It's got its lights on and stuff. I'm just over this next little bridge. And there was a bit of a beep. And I've put my hand in the air, obviously, to say that I've seen them. And then the van's come under the bridge that I'm just walking over. And then the van's now on the other side, running parallel with me. And then, then it drives off into the distance. Between there, I've, I've now probably got about another two miles to walk. And, yep, carry on inspection is normal. Like I say, it's quite a hardy patrol. You know, there's been a few suicides in this area and stuff. And mm. there's a corner what we come to. It's called Suicide Corner. Unfortunately, many years ago, uh, there was a young couple who wanted to end their lives. And they parked the vehicle up. They went and sat on the track or lay on the track or something and let, let a tree run over them. It can be a bit, you know, you sort of, it's a little bit scary. Do you I'm not saying it's scary. But you sort of get what I'm saying. You've got your wits about you. Yeah, there's an emotional scar about the place. Yeah, it's, it's not nice you know, when you hear about you know things like that and you've got to walk through these areas. So, yeah, carry on one patrol. And, you know, I've, I've walked on for another, another two miles. And I'm, I'm just on the approach now to the Earl Sidings. So what I can see in the distance is, you know, the, the track goes in. It's probably about five or six lanes of track to, to my right-hand side. And it's full of cement wagons. My colleagues there waiting for me in the transit van. They're, they're parked in the sidings and the van's facing away from me. And yeah, I have a quick look at the sidings and I walk over to the van and I open the side door. Right. So that's your shift over? Yeah, that's my inspection over. Yep. And I opened the side door and my two colleagues give me this look. Like, and <laughs> I'm like, guys, I'm like, you won't believe this. And they looked at me. And they went, Billy, they went, we don't know what it was, but see, when we passed you, when we were coming up to you at Edale Road in the van and we could see you, they said you were being followed by something and it was only about 20 or 30 yards behind you. They said it looked like a big dog. That was their exact words. Now, what I think it was, yeah, I, I think that has followed me, that, that panther has followed me from the station. Yeah, and, and they spotted me just over a mile from the station. Now, I didn't know it was behind me. At any time did I know anything was behind me. And, uh, I, you know, when they said that to me, well, I'm thinking, how far has this followed before? You know, I, I didn't hear a thing behind me. You tend not to look behind you. When you're inspecting the direction of traffic, we walk facing the, the oncoming traffic. So if anything does, say anything comes through at night time, you're inspected, well, you're ready for it, you can see it. Yeah. You never travel, you never walk with your back to traffic uh, on the railway. Yeah. So you put your wits about you. You're looking at you doing a job. For the next week, my name's on that section of the track. So if a train comes off within the next week, they go inspection team who was inspected. You've got to be doing your job properly, Rick. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You focus just on what you're doing and nothing else. Yeah. So you know whether you see a cat or not, my name's my, my name's still on that piece of track. You know what I mean? So you, you know you you do it to the best of your ability. 
you're looking in front of you all the time. You're taking note. And then, yeah, they say to me, right, there was something behind you. Well, I'm thinking to myself, well, if that was behind me up until that point, how far has it actually followed me for? That could have stalked me all the way to the sidings. I won't know. They didn't feel that they needed to stop and really try and detain you because they weren't aware that it's potentially a big black leopard panther type animal. No. They just assumed it no. was a dog like animal, which is not much of a risk. That's what they said. They said, you know, the look, the look they give me, the way they said it, they thought that I knew it was behind me. And of course, they couldn't phone you up anyway because the mobile phones were not there and working. But I've got no phone signal. Yeah. So obviously, whatever, whatever they saw, they thought I knew it was there, but I never knew it was there. I'd, I'd only witnessed the, the cat at the station. You know, that was, that was their sighting, the second one. I never knew it was there. What his account was, he said, we were coming towards travel on the road, and they looked up towards the line, and behind me, you know, 20 to 30 yards behind me, there was this big black thing following me. They said it was big. Now, what they said it was doing, it was walking along the rail. They said they, they got a clear view of it, not clear enough to make out it was a panther but they've got a clear view of it. The space between the two rails is called the forefoot. Now, if it had been walking in the forefoot on the ballast or the sleepers in the middle, yeah, they wouldn't have got a clear view of it because it would have been set back a bit. Yeah. Because it's an embankment. So they said it, you know, it was walking along the, the rail head. Now, that'll be why I didn't hear it, Rick. Yes. Because it was creeping along. Yeah. Also, really, if you think about the locomotion of a cat versus a dog, uh, and it's a bit like a cat a domestic cat walking along the top of a fence. Yep. A, a dog can't do that, really. They, can't, they haven't got the dexterity of their sort of legs and paws, whereas that's what cats do. Yep. That would totally make sense. It's quiet. The thing is with, with the railway, anything that walks onto the railway, whether it be a rabbit, whether it be a badger, a fox, a deer, a sheep, as soon as it puts one foot on them stones, when they put one foot on that, it makes a noise. Yep. I think this animal knows how to use the railway. Well, of course, there is the Helensborough railway footage. You might have seen that. Yeah, I have, yeah. It walks along the railhead like only cats do, and that's not that big, but it seems to be sort of intermediate-sized uh-huh. cat. That footage was taken by a military policeman, wasn't he? He was calling on a mate, right. and he saw it. The garden overlooked it, and you can hear him sort of racing back from his car with the phone and then putting it on the animal, watching the animal. We'll put a link to that on the website. About 10 years old, but very good bit of footage that, actually. When you told them about the uh, sighting, the four-minute sighting in the station, what was their reaction? Barry, he just went, no way. And I went, yeah, mate. I said, I said this thing was massive. And it just sat looking at me. And he went, he went, oh, meaning like, you know, it's he, he's, he's, put, he's put two and two together then. Yeah. You know, he's thinking, wow, if, <laughs> if what he's saying is true, then that's what we must have saw. And then he knows the distance. You know, he knows how far the station is from where he came across me. He knows what it is, and it stalked me. Yeah, for, for what we know of, at least one mile, 1.2 miles that we know of. So I emailed one of my leopard contacts in South Africa, and I said, what is the longest distance you know for a leopard stalking or following somebody? And, and I said, can you beat just over a mile, marginally over a mile. And he said, absolutely no way. Gosh, that is very yeah. surprising. And he wasn't necessarily thinking it was stalking you with intent. He did feel mm-hmm. it could have just been, you know, monitoring you because you're in its zone. Yeah, yeah. You need to be monitored. <laughs> you know, what are you doing encroaching yeah. on its territory and comfort zone? So, yeah, we'll never know, will we? But how does it make you feel? Well, what I think is, the cat itself has been confused at first. I, th- I think, obviously, seeing the bright light, it doesn't know what I am. It probably thinks I'm smaller than what I am. Obviously, leaving that station, I was telling you I had to go across a bridge. Now, I, I think the cat's come onto the track as soon as I've left that station, and it's followed me over the bridge. For it not to follow me over the bridge, it must have gone around the long way. You know what I mean? It would have gone you know, out of the car park, across the road, through the wood. I think it's used the bridge as ease of access to get behind me. Something else to take into account, Rick, is you know, I'm wearing high vis. You know, high vis stripes. Now, it's not understood the light to start with. And then, if it has got a glimpse of me, I would only look small, you know, because it only sees a fraction of me, top side of the platform. Now, when it's come out behind me, it's probably thought, hang on a minute, this thing was small a minute ago. And then now, it's a 
a full size person. And then maybe mixed with high vis as well. And then I've got a light sort of, it's not flashing, but it's moving direction. You know, it's looking from left to right, left to right, you know, back and forward. And I think it's for, what is this? Yes. I, I think it's maybe just being curious. Yeah, you're nothing like it's ever experienced before, perhaps. Exactly. Unless unless it has seen you another time, of course, though. Maybe. You or colleagues have done that, you know, routinely, weekly, previously. Yes, every, every week, yeah. Yeah, but I think you're right. It may be as puzzled and not quite used to that kind of stature and brightness mm-hmm. and We'll never know, but, you know, a tentative conclusion is it's monitoring you and observing you and curious. Yeah, so how does it make me feel? Well, uh, sure, it's, it's, it's a mixed feelings, really. I quite like the fact that it was checking me out, to be <laughs> honest. You know, it was curious to see, you know, what what was doing. I personally don't think it would have harmed me, to, to be honest. If it wanted to harm me and attack me, it had a perfect opportunity at the station. Yeah. And a mile's worth of tracking afterwards. Yes, exactly. And then follow me for a mile as well. At least a mile, of course. It could have gone further. Oh, yeah. But then I think to myself, if I had been walking along there and something, I'd have jumped on my back. I don't know what I would have done. <laughs> yeah. you would. Well, you wouldn't have been ready for it. It would have been pinned you to the ground if it needed to. That's it. That's it. Just a quick break for our word of the week, and it is ABCs, or Alien Big Cats. This is one of the dying out terms that sometimes gets used for our subject. It's never been an appropriate and valid term because the lynx, and Eurasian lynx, is one of the candidate cats from the mix of reports, and of course that's Britain's historical native larger cat. So ABCs and Alien Big Cats really doesn't apply when we have the lynx in the equation. There's no one easy collective term for the large cats here, even if we do mainly resort to big cats, as does this podcast. But puma and lynx aren't officially big cats in the sense of being a panthera cat, so it's always a struggle to find an appropriate term. There's an irony in labelling the cats alien big cats because it's likely that a large part of their diet will be alien deer species and alien rabbits, if you want to get purist about it, even alien pheasants. I was agonising about different terms for these large cats for my talk at last week's 2020 Tetsu Zoom conference. I ended up calling my talk the Deer Killing Cats of Britain, and it's their function in that ecosystem that matters most, perhaps. I'm grateful to the artists from Tetsu.com for their illustrations during the course of the event. You can see one of these pieces of art depicting an alien big cat appropriately dressed in a spacesuit. We've put that on the website under episode 40. And thanks again to Darren Naish of TetsuCon for hosting the discussion and workshop on big cats. And Darren, who masterminds TetsuCon and the renowned Tetsu blog, will be a guest on this show for an episode probably in February. We certainly look forward to that. So there's our word of the week and term of the week, ABC's Alien Big Cats. Has it influenced the way did it well, did it influence the way you did your next inspections? Did you always think, gosh, you know, there could be a cat around? How did it influence your approach to things? I'm not scared of them. Yeah. But I'm more curious about them now. You know, so if I was looking for them, I wasn't looking over my shoulder to think, oh, is there a cat following me to be attacked or anything? I'm more curious now. You know, I, I keep my wits about me, hoping to see another. You know, that's that's what you know, when you know what's out there. You know, I, I know a million percent these these big cats out there, big black cats, you know, panthers, whatever. I know a million, I'm a million percent. You know what I mean? So I would love the chance to see another one without, without a doubt. I would love the chance. It doesn't unnerve you, though, when you're in the outdoors? No. Or did it unnerve you for a while, though, when you did your next few inspections? Yeah, I had my wits about me, I would say. And, and yeah, do you know what? If you hear a noise or something or, you know, you could be walking on these tracks and then you hear something and what it'll be, it'll be a day jump and a fence. It'll jump a fence. It'll run across the stones for the ballast and then it'll hop the other fence. So yeah, if I've been out inspecting, like, like I say, that night I was on my own. Usually it's two of us. You've got a hand to hold basically. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, absolutely intriguing. Thank you so much for that. No, no, it's all right. We now ought to take the opportunity to ask you about what a, a railway line inspector encounters in terms of debris animal impacts 
what would it be like for a wandering panther, a wandering apex predator who might want to scavenge along a railway line? Would they find plenty of pickings? What goes on along a railway line? My theory, I've looked a bit more into them now. I speak to Paul McDonald, I spoke to yourself. And now what I've tried to do is, between us, you know, paint a picture of how it may hunt, why it's at the railway and stuff. Yeah. My theory is, there's lots of roadkill. We'll just call it roadkill. We've been on the railway. You know, you come across everything from sheep, you know, plenty of sheep, deer. I've encountered horses, donkeys. These been badgers. I've come across dogs, cats. You name it, you know, unfortunately people as well. It's easy pickings for an apex predator of that size. It would be very, very easy just to go on the railway at night time. And, you know, every, every inspection I've done, in my whole real career, I've, I've done hundreds of inspections. I've always come across a dead animal, you know, and see that area. You know, when I think back now, surrounded by fields, surrounded by fences, there's always been the smell, of, especially on that inspection mm-hmm. of dead animals. You know, whether it's been related to this panther or not, I don't know. But there's always been that smell in the air, you know, you know especially on a calm night, travels in the air, you know. So there's always been dead animals around that area. That smell, it's fresh, is it? Because sometimes a rotting carcass can be pretty uh, pungent and unpleasant, but it, this is fresh meat, is it? Yeah, yeah, yep. The way the railway is, so the benefits for an apex predator is there's, there's not many people there. You know, even the public doesn't go near a railway. Mm. Really, only uh, railway uh, employees will, will see a railway track. The closest the everyday person gets to, to see a railway has been on a train. Then both sides of the railway is fenced off. So you imagine being an apex predator walking down the railway. You could just sit still, right? So anything that wants to cross the railway line, for example, like a deer, or it's got an obstruction to get on there, so it'll probably make a noise getting on there. It'll come either up an embankment, it'll come down a ravine, and then it'll come onto the railway. Now, as soon as it steps one foot onto them stones, it's made a noise, right? So if you were a big cat sitting, and then you hear a noise on the on the ballast, you see what it was. You've got a nice clear view. Then it's got, a, wherever the animal is crossing the track has to come over the stones and then it's got to get over another fence yet. So really, as soon as it comes onto railway property, it's enclosed. And if you're an apex predator, you've got a perfect opportunity then to get your victim, haven't you? Yeah, so you've got scavenging or predatory stalking yeah, options yeah. either way. And in terms of the dead animals, what are the type of impacts you, you see on the carcasses? From a train impact? There's a rule of thumb on the railway. Anything below 80 mile an hour. Now, obviously, it depends how big it is. So, so let's just take a day, for example. A day being hit below 80 will normally have an impact and then be thrown to the side of the track. Anything above 80 mile an hour tends to explode uh, or breaks on impact. So say, for example, you know a, train, a train's hit a day at 90 mile an hour. What you'll get is a strike, and then it'll open up, and it'll be spread as far as it'll be carried. Sounds a bit awful. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> uh, but it'll be it'll be sort of spread up spread up the track over a distance. But if it's been hit below, say 40, 50, 60 mile an hour, obviously, if it's hit head on right in front of the train, you know there's, there's a chance it'll go under the wheels. Uh, and then then again, you know, if it's under the wheels, then it's going to be spread up the track again. But then it, you know you'll have a, you'll have a smell in the air then, you know. So that that'll attract foxes, it'll attract badgers, it'll it'll attract you know panthers. Uh, anything that, that's that's a carnivore, it, it'll attract. Uh, do train drivers see this impact then regularly? Well, any, anything I see from from an impact, a, a, a driver's going to see. If there's anything, you know, as an inspection team, you know, we'll try and move anything off the railway. You know, with, with gloves and, and taking safety precautions, you know, we'll we'll move it out of the way. It's not nice for uh, you know passengers to see. You know, we'll, we'll we'll tend to put it off off to one side. Drivers hit. Quite a few things, you know, I've seen domestic cats, you, you know, cut in half, you know, dogs and stuff, you know, we've we found, and when we report this, you know, we, we take a note, you know, we, we found an inspection report out, you know, we've got teams there within within the real industry who will come out and they'll, they'll bag animals up, especially if it's got a collar on it, the owners get notified, you know, we don't just, you, know, you don't just leave them. Mm. Owners are notified if, if we come across anything. Basically, however the uh, carcass is left, whether it's in many pieces spread up and down the line or it's in bigger chunks, there are pickings for whatever size scavenger yes. predator. Yes. Yeah, plenty of it. Yep. What about the other sort of theory and hunch that a lot of us have is that the cats would use these routes to get easy access across the country, 
because it's um, a linear direct route with no hassle. It's a, it's a line of least resistance, like they would use cycleways and canal routeways, that sort of thing. Would you say that's a possibility? I, w- I would totally agree with that. You know, a few reasons. If you've got an area with a ravine and there's a bridge, these cats, you know, some size of animal, they don't want to use a lot of energy. I mean, why go down, say, an embankment across a river and back up the other side when you can use a railway bridge? You know, there's, there's nobody about. The other thing is uh, tunnels. You know, what I was saying to you about uh, Calvin Tunnel is the deepest tunnel in the UK. I'm not too sure how uh, deep the shafts are, like to the, to the summit of the hill above it. I mean, you think about it, you know, going across that hill, how long it would take us? An apex predator would just use a tunnel. You know, it's, it just makes common sense, doesn't it, you know, to, yeah. to use a tunnel rather than rather than go over the hill. The other thing is trains, when, when trains are coming towards you on the track, you know when they're coming. You can hear, we, we say the rail's singing. That's what you say. You know, the rail's making a noise. And vibrating if you're on it. Yeah, that, that that's it. And, and the cat's hearing and, and senses. I, I don't know how many times better they are than a human. But, you know, they, they would hear a train coming from maybe, you know, a mile or two away. You know, you can, you can stand back. So, you know, they, 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 they get a warning that there's danger coming so they can they can sit back. And then they, they can just carry on the way. And, yeah, it, it would make sense that, that they can uh, just, just hop on the railway line and then and then go between you know areas it is um surprising that there aren't more drivers that see them i can think of two cases in the press and i have a friend who works for great western railways southwest operator and he put an email out to all the drivers and um, none of them came back admitting that they'd seen one what i'd say to that is uh, in the daytime i've never seen any in the daytime you know, I've, I've been all over the Peak District in, in, in the daytime, and, and I've, I've never come across one. The, the only one I was telling you, you know, the, the sighting was like the sandy coloured puma, but was spotted eating a fish. Trains run at night time and in the dark. Now, train lights are terrible. The light on a train are absolutely terrible. Because they don't need to be good. No, they don't need to be because they're looking for a signal. Yeah. I have a qualified locomotive driver as well. You know, at night time, travelling on a train in a driver's cab, you know, you might as well, you know, apart from having lights for visibility for, say, workers up ahead to see you, an oncoming train, you you know, you might as well switch them off because all you're watching for is a red light, a yellow light, or red and amber, or a green that you're watching for and, you know, when you're driving a train. 90% of the rail infrastructure in the UK is pitch black. Okay, well, thanks for that. That's such a good insight to life along a railway track. And uh... Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we did have, I have to say, actually, we, I do remember a report to Frank Tunbridge in the Stroud Valleys on the Stroud to Campbell stretch. There were some railway maintenance guys and they did see a puma on the embankment um, above them along that stretch. Very clearly, you know, American Mountain Lion was their quote. That was a railway line type of encounter. So they're coming back to me now. <laughs> Yeah, so and now you've moved up to Scotland and you've got involved with Paul MacDonald and the network of people on the case investigating there. So yes. that's that's good news. Is that nice to be um, rekindling the interest? Yeah, yeah. Having this cat sighting, obviously, I, I, I know what's out there. You know, there's a lot of people who, who still go out there who haven't seen a, a, a big cat. And uh, I take my hat off to them, right? You know, because there's, you know, there's a lot of sceptics, there's a lot of rubbish there on the, on the internet and stuff. Like I say, I can tell you a million percent they exist, obviously. But uh, yeah, I met with Paul McDonald. We had some reports come in from some horse riders. There was, there was two horse riders out together. I, I won't disclose the, the actual location because yeah, uh, you know the farm won't be too happy if I start giving out, out the location. There was two horse riders out hacking one winter. They went into a, an ex-military complex. It's all bunkers and, and so sh- all shut down now. They found some bunkers. They got off the horse and one of them went into a, into a bunker. And when the other woman followed her in, she just said to her friend, don't look and just come to me and just run, come out. And what it was, the second woman who went in there, there was a jet black puma lying above a door and like a little shelf. But I'm not, not too sure how it sort of looked inside. From what I gather, there was two rooms in this bunker. And the first woman's gone in, gone down through a doorway into the first room, into the next room. And when the woman's followed her down, the first woman hasn't even spotted this cat. And the, uh, <laughs> the the second woman walked down and just thought, what is that? T- told her friend to get out. So, yeah, we with that report come out. So we got the location. And we went to this area. And we did find a bunker. There was there was several bunkers. In fact, more than several. There was uh, probably about 20 bunkers. 
on this site. We had a good look at them all. There was one, one had maybe a slight, a slight bit of evidence that, that something had been in there eating. You, you couldn't tell what it was. We found some bones. There was some teeth mark, well, like lines, like, uh, like, like some sort of teeth marks or whatever. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Paul had photographed it. Paul picked up the bones. He said, no, he says, that's, that's a tooth mark or something, that one. But then, on the way out, we found a bunker, but the doorway had been covered up. Intentionally, it had been blocked for some reason. We've got the photographs of this. When we went on top of the bunker, there was like a, a hatch at the top. Now, the hatch, it wasn't in a way that something would just walk and fall in. Yeah, It was like it had an upright on it. To get in there, you'd have to be intentionally trying to get into it. It wasn't just like an opening on the floor. It was like like a small chimney. When we looked in it, I'm telling you, you'd never seen as many bones of animals in, in, in your life. Hundreds, absolutely hundreds in there. Now, it wasn't like, uh, like I say, something had fell in there and died in that position. There was piles and piles and piles of bones. Like something had been taken say like uh, badgers back or taking foxes back or rabbits and eating them and then discarding all the bones in a pile. It was like a layer. That's, that's exactly what it was. Paul will tell you yourself. We took a load of photographs and Paul went, wow. He says, I have never seen as many bones as that in, in one area in my life. Okay. Are you able to examine them for tooth marks, for tooth pits that we um, want to help Royal Agricultural University's lab work with? Yeah. What we we'll have to do in that case is we, we'll have to get a ladder and basically go into this, the upright, the, the chimney bit, if, if you know what I mean, because the entrance for this one's been totally blocked off. For what reason? None, none of the other entrances to any other bunker were blocked off besides this one. And coincidentally, inside it was all these bones. Okay, yeah, like somebody knew that there was a lair and wanted to stop it. That's what we thought, yeah. If we got a ladder and put it down, yeah, we could get in there. We, we, what we managed to do was, was put our uh, camera down and take some photographs. And there's nothing in it just now. You know, there's not, not an animal you know, lurking in it, but there's plenty of bones. Any stash like that that's a potential graveyard lair situation is worth looking for toothpits. Yeah, I mean, obviously you don't take any risks, but if you fancy doing that, it could be a way of getting some samples to check at the Royal Agricultural University. Yeah, yeah. You know the landowner, so that's good to keep in touch with yep. them and do it properly and get permission. Well, that's splendid that you now linked up with some of the Scotland investigators and we'll look forward to hearing any more about that. And before the final discussion on what you think more generally about big cats, now, if people have interesting day jobs now, we, you know, we just go off topic for a couple of minutes. Do tell us about your work, Factory Settings, it's called, isn't it, Billy? Yes, so it's called Restore to Factory Settings. It's my own educational uh, organisation. We build out-the-box programmes for ex servicemen and women you know, disengaged teenagers, special needs, uh, anyone really who's maybe got practical skills and they've become isolated uh, in society, you know, especially in this this climate at the moment obviously with, with this COVID-19. But yeah, we, we build a lot of out-of-the-box stuff. So, for example, you know, a couple of our projects, there's a, there's a ship in Dundee, it's called the North Car. It's going to be a, a museum for Dundee and a, a, a memorial for the RNLI. It's owned by a charity called Tamara. They've asked us to take the ship out of the water. Um, and what we do is, we, we supply people uh, and we use restoration as a therapy and we uh, we put people on the job and basically we're going to restore the whole ship, you know, take out the water, you know, shot blast it, paint it, and then it'll be dry docked in Dundee to become a museum. We've got a, a motocross track over in Lanarkshire to build. We're going to be building a, a motorcycle and activity centre over in Lanarkshire. Remarkable stuff like I like it anyway. You know, people come through there, you know, with addictions. We've had... People, you know, have a, have a bit of a hard time in their life. And, you know, they've come in. We teach welding, fabrication, uh, mechanical engineering. We've restored tractors. You know, we've been in magazines. Quite a new organization. We've got support, you know, all over the UK now. Quite a big following. And you see the change in the, in the people that you're helping that are supporting the work? One lad who came in, he'd been 13 years old, uh, suffering from, it, from addiction. I won't go into too much detail. Hmm. We took him in supported him now he's full-time employed can't give too many details out you know of the that's a result for you that's a huge result for you yeah yeah so we restore items we restore people we restore communities you know that's that's what we do well we'll put a link to that on our website billy so if anybody does want to make contact and so it's based in locally is it uh, in fife 
it's in Fife, uh, but we're linked into uh, you know Tayside. We've got a project in Tayside there. We've got a project in Lanarkshire. We've created a, a practical route in, instead of uh, having like a, you know the mainstream academic route. And uh, there's a lot of people out there with talent, and it, it just never ever gets out. So what we do is, you know, create a practical program. Everything's practical, everything. And they, they get assessed, you know, get, get qualifications. Splendid. Very nice to mention that, Billy, and good luck with that. And we'll put a link on the website. Yeah, thank you very much. Great. Okay. Now, finally, the question that we ask all our guests, what about this bigger picture, potentially, you know, a small population of these panthers, black leopards and sandy brown pumas? What do you reckon on the bigger picture? Well, well, I think, I think personally, I think they've been here for a long time. First of all, not just come here overnight, and they've not done us any harm already. They tend to keep themselves to themselves. Yeah, I think they're curious, but you know what? Me personally, I, I would like a population of them to be in Britain, breeding and stuff, and they're not going to do us any harm, I don't think. I wouldn't like to go near the cubs. You know, I, th- I think the only time a human really would be in danger is if you came across some cubs and you were to go near them and you were to be, you know, warned off. I think if they were, if they were going to do us any harm. Yeah, we would have heard about it way before now. What about if you lost your dog? You know, what about the downsides, potentially? Yeah, you're right there. There has been a few few sheep attacks and stuff. And, you know, from, from a farmer's point of view, if I was a farmer and I was having like three or four sheep go missing every month, I don't think I'd be very happy, uh, especially if it was lambing season. I mean, farmers will pay that the dogs have gone in, in near lambing time and you've got pregnant sheep in the field. You know, people are putting dogs in the field and dogs have been shot. You know, so yeah, you know, you can't have one rule for one, one rule for another. If if a big cat's going to go in a field and start worrying sheep or killing sheep, you know, the farmers are going to going to do something about it, aren't they? And and to be honest, I don't blame them. I I don't like the thought of a big cat getting killed, but you know, if like like, like I say, you know, it's they've, they've got to protect the the living, haven't they? If anything has happened to uh, sheep stocks, then you know it's usually been at night time. You know, the same time that, that I would have seen them on my site. Farmers are up at four or four in the morning and they're not going to bed till 10 o'clock. The last thing they want is to be is to be out all night, you know, looking for big cats. So, yeah, you know, it's uh, and, and I suppose even if one was killed, I don't think we'd hear about it anyway. I think it would be a, a story we buried, wouldn't it? You know, along with a cat, you know, it's, uh, I don't think it would get spoke about. Anything else you wanted to say, Billy, on the subject that you we haven't touched on? We've run over time, but it's been worth running over time. We knew this was going to be a long one, but it's been certainly um, good value. So thank you for that. But any final point you want to make before we close off? Well, I've been going out with Paul and stuff, and there's, there's been another sighting in recently. There, there was a gentleman who owns a roofing company not far away, described a, a sandy coloured puma crossing the road. What I will be doing is I will be getting a trail cam. I've already gone and spoke to the gentleman, he took me to the site where he'd seen it. There was some evidence of, of a large animal on the path that basically he was coming down a road. I won't, I won't go into too much detail. I don't know if we've got enough time. But there was a sandy coloured puma the size of an Alsatian across the road in front of him at half past six one morning. It was coming up from a river. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a trail camp. I'm going to get set up on, on, on that path. There's a disused quarry nearby as well. You know, and it was walking to the, the direction of the, the quarry. There was also another gentleman uh, sent us a message, me and Paul. And he spotted two what he thought was black panthers together. And I'm just away to go and get the location tomorrow. And I'll be out seeing him and get some prints. OK, so these are fresh, recent reports. Yeah, yeah, yep. You can be in the sort of Fife area. You can be a follow-up investigator. Well, that's what my plan is anyway, yeah. Very good. Well, good luck on that. And we'll keep in touch. And um, that's great that Paul's, I mean, Paul's doing some great work, you know, helping the network. Yeah, he is. Yep, yep. And gaining a lot of trust. And we're going to hear from Paul fairly soon on another episode. We certainly heard from him in the first Scotland episode. We'll hear from him again. Well, Billy, uh, thank you ever so much for these um, sightings reports. Uh, thanks for having me on. Well, pleasure. And thank you for the briefing on the railway line environment, because I think that really has answered a lot of our curious minds on the subject. It's as full on environment as we suspected for a cat for its both its movements and for its food take. Thanks ever so much, Billy. All the best to you. Thanks ever so much for coming on Big Cat Conversations. Thanks for having me on. Cheers, Rick. OK, if you're listening on schedule, it's running up to Christmas time as this show comes out. So time to say Merry Christmas and a very happy Yuletide. That concludes the show. And thanks again to Billy, our guest, for his contribution, which has been a fitting one, I think, for episode 40. We'll be back around the turn of the year. 
and it will be another report from the Tetbury area, which we visited for part of episode 38. This new encounter we'll hear about is a full-on sighting of a panther stalking and cornering its prey. It's a fascinating case, and we discuss several other examples in that recording. Righto, thanks for your support through the year, everyone. Have a great Christmas, and bye for now.